In this video, I'd like to illustrate and discuss the anatomy of the clitoris. The clitoris has been in the news lately. There have been a number of articles announcing it as if it's a, a discovery, and for some, it is a discovery. For some others, we've been exploring and seeking to improve our understanding of the clitoris for our whole careers, including me. So in the laboratory, I've had the great privilege uh, to dissect and present and teach about this incredible and interesting and complex structure for the last three decades. So I've hundreds of times I've had the opportunity to actually explore the anatomy of the clitoris in situ with cadaver studies in the laboratory. And it's, it's truly a marvel. Uh, and it's always my intention in teaching on this subject or sharing what I've learned about it to to elevate and to share and to basically give the clitoris back to those who have them, as it were, so that you might incorporate this incredible structure in your body and, and sort of lay claim to it and, and comprehend the, the blessing and the, the gift that, that this uh, complex and beautiful organ is. So let's start with, uh, let's start with the beginnings. So, we don't normally get to do dissection, right? So it's easy to not understand the clitoris because its external presentation, uh, as some of you know, is kind of a, a hmm, an ending point, right? So what we really see is the, I don't wanna say iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, but we see the beginnings of the structure. And even this presentation, which we call the glands, clitoris or the, the glands of the clitoris is covered in skin. Now, which skin would that be? It's called the, the hood, the hood of the clitoris. And the hood of the clitoris is a tissue homologue or direct embryological um, uh, analogy to the, to the foreskin of the penis, which I did a video on at another date. And people said, well, then teach us about the clitoris as well. So we're going to put the I'm going to put a little foreskin here, a little hood is partly opened and in, in this image. And this skin, of course, will be connected to the skin of the whole body. So the glands is covered by a foreskin. And this can be uh, a, a source of great pleasure. And on the downside, it can sometimes adhere and that can be painful. So if you have an adherent hood of the clitoris to the clitoris, you'd want to, to um, take, take means and seek help uh, your own or, or, a, or a helper to um, relieve that adhesion so that the foreskin moves freely, <laughs> the foreskin, the hood moves freely over the glands of the clitoris. Now, what else is there though hiding beneath the skin? So we have here uh, the shaft of the clitoris. So we're going to go this way with a shaft. And so we have the glands and the shaft. And the shaft proceeds or expands into what we call the, the legs, the crus or the crura, because there's actually two. So crus, singular, crura, plural. Right? So we have the two crura of the clitoris, and they follow the, the ischium, the pubic bone and the ischium at the pelvis. So uh, the clitoris sits right here and then its legs follow this bone here, right? The pubic bone here, the clitoris is positioned at the pubic symphysis and its legs or crura extend this way. So you get the orientation of the drawing. Now that's not all. So glands, shaft, crura, but also rooted at the base of the clitoris here are kind of bulbous structures. And those bulbous structures extend down. And I'm drawing them a little bit like little saddlebags because they're shaped kind of like that. So we have what we call the vestibular bulbs. Now vestibule means like an entryway. So these are the vestibules to the vagina. So all of these tissues in blue are erectile tissues. 
That means during excitation, they engorge with blood, they fill, and they change shape consequently, the same way a penis changes its shape when it engorges with blood. So these tissues fill the glands, the shaft, the crura, and the vestibule, but also the perineal body. What's the perineal body? So the perineum is that spanning of tissue between the vaginal opening and the anus. So the soft uh, spongy tissue between the vaginal opening and the anus has deep within it what we call the perineal body. So imagine maybe a little more erectile tissue. So we have erectile tissue all through here. We have erectile tissue here in the perineal body, erectile tissue here in the vestibular bulbs, and there's more erectile tissue. So there's also here what we call the urethral sponge. Now at the center of the urethral sponge is an opening through which the urine passes. Now you're saying, what does that have to do with the clitoris? Well, some people will include all of these erectile tissues in their understanding of the clitoris. Far be it for me to tell you where the clitoris ends in a continuous body. Anatomically speaking, or let's say in our culture, people think this is the clitoris. In our medical textbooks, they may include this as the clitoris. In many uh, books I've seen written and discussing the clitoris, they'll also include the vestibular bulbs and maybe even the urethral sponge. They have different names, but lots of organs have many different named aspects. So if we're just trying to create an inventory of the tissues that are participating in this structure, these would all be included. Now, the urethral sponge is an elongated spanning of tissue that wraps around the urethra, which is maybe an inch and a half long. When you have a clitoris, you have a relatively short urethra. So here's the urethra, and back here is the bladder. So the urine fills the bladder, passes out the urethra, and the urethra is surrounded by erectile tissue, and it's erogenous. In fact, all of these tissues, including the skin here, which we don't want to forget about, we have skin covering here all along the body is covered with skin. So all of these tissues are participating in the nerve supply from the pudendal nerve. I don't use the word pudendal nerve very much. The history of the word is fraught with judgment. Pudendal basically indicates the parts of shame. <laughs> this is an old word and is accompanied by some old shame. I don't see how anything this beautiful and amazing should be associated with shame myself. Um, it's a gift and it's a marvel of of uh, biological engineering and, and of creative uh, organization. So I use the word delectatal. I like that. <laughs> instead of pudendum to describe all this area, I describe the delectatum. And instead of the pudendal nerve or artery or vein, I like to talk about the delectatal artery or nerve or vein. Now, I'm just making this up, folks, because why not? It's our anatomy. Uh, I don't mind renaming things now and then, and delictatal means delight. So instead of referencing the parts of shame, I'd rather reference the parts of delight. Now, for years they've been saying, the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings, perhaps twice as much as the glands of the penis. Now, I don't like to get into number competition, but recently they've upped that estimate to 10,000 nerve endings. So there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity in these tissues, but where? Well, that's what's interesting because the distribution of the nerve endings varies from person to person like everything else about the person. Your face is different, your, your hands are different, and the distribution of your, of your nerve endings are different in the pars intima, the intimate region here. So some people will have a great amount of uh, pleasure and erotic stimulation from direct contact with the, 
the glands clitoris. For others, uh, there's too much sensitivity there and they'd prefer indirect contact with this structure because it's so sensitive. Other people will have a, a great distribution of nerve endings in the urethral sponge. Again, all connected to the same delictotal nerve. So there might be a greater enjoyment from direct contact with the urethral sponge. Some people have a, a great deal of nerve endings in the perineal area and the anus. So depends on the person where a person will feel the most uh, energy upon being stimulated. So I'd like to show you a model which may also be helpful to understand this because it's hard to understand the abstractness of a two-dimensional drawing. So right here, I'm, I think I'm going to show it this way, if I can. So you see what I have here is a box that I designed. It's made out of cherry wood. And I believe that any anatomy model should be beautiful because anatomy is beautiful and amazing. And so this is solid cherry wood. And how does it open? We have to think about it. It looks like there's doors here. Sure enough, doors. And what's inside? Sitting on that beautiful ruby silk pillow is a silver model of this same region. Now, I'm going to take this out of here so I can show it to you. So what do we have here? We see, like our drawing, the glands and the shaft of the clitoris. We see the Crura here, the legs or the crura, we see the opening of the vagina and the vestibular bulbs, oriented a little differently than the drawing, as they wrap towards the perineal body here and the anus here. And then what do we have here? We have the, the urethral meatus and the urethral sponge. So urethral sponge, erectal, vestibular bulbs, erectal, Crura, erectile, shaft and glands, erectile, perineal body, erectile, all innervated by the same nerve. One beautiful structure made out of one single ounce of pure 0.999 silver, a soft metal that is conductive of, of energy, right? So just like the pars intima, we have a model that's also conductive and highly reflective, we see ourselves here. It's also at scale of one to one, basically, this tissue. And let's put it here on the pelvis, and you can see how it would be oriented there. So I hope that's a useful uh, three-dimensional model for you. I've taken uh, great pleasure in making these sorts of models and, uh, and sharing them with folks because I feel like being educated about the clitoris is uh, something that should be just part of our general, our general knowledge of the human body. I'd like to add one more anatomical feature. I've cleared the board and moved our model so that I can show you also some more details about the anatomy of the clitoris. So let's return to our glands here. And we had our, the rest of it, of course. But at the glands, there are two sort of um, pro projections of skin from the base of the glands. Now, we discussed the hood of the clitoris, which is analogous to the foreskin, and the fourchette, or forking tissues, uh, that are part of the glands clitoris as well, I want to add because they're anchoring or basically represent the anchoring of the inner labia to the glands. So we have our inner labia, maybe several folds of skin that are all anchored to the very end point of the clitoris and extending the vestibule of the vagina so that the uh, inner labia are actually 
uh, in direct relationship with the vestibular bulbs. So if you're wanting to find the vestibular bulbs, like where are they? Well, you could follow the inner labia and you would come upon the vestibular bulbs. Similarly, if you're, these uh, inner labia will also be hiding the uh, urethral sponge, which lives in here. Now, the urethral sponge got in the news a lot years ago because that projection of tissue, the anterior aspect or wall of the vagina, is highly sensitive, as we mentioned, and it became known as the G-spot. Well, in anatomy, we call it the urethral sponge, and indeed, it is highly uh, supplied with sensitive nerve endings. So I'm just adding to the story a little bit here so you get a sense of the relationships of the inner hidden structures to the more external structures like the inner labia. I call them inner labia rather than labia minor because as you know, if you've, if you've maybe looked at yourself in the mirror, some people's inner labia are more fulsome than their outer labia. And so it doesn't make much sense to call them major and minor they should be called inner and outer, right? It's a more accurate description of all uh, people who, have, uh, who are expressing these tissues in their body. So I'm gonna add one more thing too. So here's the, here's the, uh, the legs coming down inside of the stibular bulbs, but the clitoris, does it really end there? Here's the sits bones of the pelvis and there's muscle tissue, I'll draw it in green coming off of the sits bones, the ischium, and going to this cavernous body of the clitoris. So ischiocavernosus muscle is a muscle that is following the medial aspect of the ischium and, and wrapping and anchoring here so that we have a, a tissue that can have fibrillations or involuntary contractions that make this whole system move as well as the fibers of the bulbospongiosis muscle, which anchor here to the clitoris and wrap this way. So on either side, we have muscle fibers here and here, and also crossing the perineum at this level. And that triangle of tissues are all going to be part of the orgasm response contracting and pulsing as uh, part of the discharge of the excitation wave uh, that is isn't part of our orgasm response. So, so we have our ischiocavernosus muscle, our bulbospongiosis muscle, our inner labia, and the fourchette of the, of the inner labia as they anchor to the clitoris. Again, all adding to the complex and what I think is beautiful story of the pars intima here. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to study more with me, go to gilheadley.com. There's a ton of stuff there. Enjoy.